Well, good morning and welcome to Alvesoke Evangelical Church Sunday Stream. It's great to have you tuning in. Thank you so much for joining us. My name's Andy and this is Colin and Carol. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. We're a group of Christians who live in the gospel area and uh, we meet as a church normally. Um, but during lockdown, we are meeting in this way online um, because we know an amazing God who has spoken to us and revealed himself to us, we believe, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love to welcome people um, along to our church services and to our stream. So if you're joining us for the first time, it's great to have you with us. And we really pray that you'll be able to discover a bit more about Jesus Christ. And I'm going to start our time together by reading some words from the Bible, from the book of 1 John. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. That's a wonderful challenge from the Bible um, to walk in the light, to come to God, to come into his light and to confess our sins, to have our sins shown up by that. And yet, as we take all our guilt and all our failures and all our sin, to the cross we take it to the lord jesus and the blood of god's son jesus purifies us from all sin when we trust in him and so we're going to start our time together by praying a prayer of confession confessing our sins to god drawing near to him through faith and confessing our sins and appealing to the blood of the lord jesus to forgive us so why don't we bow our heads in prayer and as we start let's think about those things in our lives and in our hearts where we are not as God would have us be, and we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. Our loving Heavenly Father, we look on our failures, we look on our sins, and we look on our lives, Lord, and we're so far from the people you would want us to be. Lord, we confess that so often we walk in the darkness, we do things for our own sakes, not for your glory and not for the good of others. We're selfish, we're greedy. Our minds and hearts come up with all sorts of horrible things that we say and do. And Lord, we confess that this sin makes us your enemies and brings us subject to your judgment. But we praise you, Father, that the blood of Jesus Christ And we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us all these sins, the sins of the week, the sins of the past, and that we would be washed clean by his blood. And as we walk in the light, we pray, Father, for your spirit's help to walk in the light in fellowship with you and in fellowship with one another. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slum slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. We're going to come now and we're going to um, sing a song together. Um, you can sing it as loudly as you can in your, in your home. And we're going to sing um, There is a Higher Throne. And uh, here we just we can remember that we have a, a king, we have a God who reigns on high and he reigns forevermore. So let's sing this song together.
Well, good morning from our All Aid slot today. And we're back in Gnome in our series, part four. There's no place like Gnome. But I thought I'd start off this morning, boys and girls and adults as well, by just asking you the question, whether you know what a musher is. Now, um, it's not quiz evening tonight. You haven't got Saturday by accident. No, this is the Sunday stream. But what is a musher? Well, a musher is a key character in this story. It's someone who rides a sled, not a sledge, but a sled that is pulled by dogs. And uh, he's going to feature in this along with his dogs. This is a story of some 1,400 people who live up in northwest Alaska, um, just in America, right at the very top near the Arctic Circle. And they need a rescuer. All the people there could die because of a diphtheria epidemic. And where some have already died of the epidemic as a consequence of contracting diphtheria, a very contagious disease that constricts the throat and stops somebody from breathing, a horrible disease. And although they have some serum in the town, it's old, and it's nowhere near enough to save the lives of everybody in the town. And like all stories, as we were thinking last week, this story had a beginning and an end. Um, but every story is actually part of a much bigger story. And we've seen that although we're focusing in on 1925 and this relatively small town, actually we could go back further and see that a significant event in this story happened when a Togo, a young Siberian husky puppy, was born. Um, so you'll notice he's 12 years old at the time of the story when we looked at it and started right at the very beginning. But Togo's owner, Leonard Seppala, was born in 1877. Maybe that's the beginning of the story. But actually every story, including mine and yours, is part of the biggest story. And that story starts with um, the world made beautiful and it starts too with man rebelling against uh, its creator, God, and refusing to obey all that he has said. And then the end of that story looks forward to a new city where the sin that first started way back there in the garden will eventually be dealt with and the power and control will be completely dealt with and it will be gone. And right in the middle of that, the biggest story ever is the story of God coming to rescue this world through the death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this little story we have in Nome and uh, your and I's, your, yours and my stories today are just a small part of the history of the entire planet and universe. But actually, we all need a rescuer and we all need Jesus. And we need to trust him and turn to him. If we're to live, if we're to have life, and if sin is to be dealt with in our lives. But it's not just Noam, as I've said, who needs a rescuer. You and I need one. I got this picture of a helicopter coming to snatch some teenagers at the top of a mountain ridge right near Mount Snowdon in Wales. Um, the children had got so scared that they refused to go any further. I don't think it's that bad up there myself. I've been there several times, including with young, young children. But they were rooted to the spot and they needed a rescue. And you can see there in the picture one has come. And perhaps you can think, boys and girls, of other rescuers and situations where you need someone to come from a long way away or somebody outside of your house to come to your place in order to save you from whatever might have happened to you. And some of you probably have gone in an ambulance. Well, that's one kind of rescuer. But the rescuer we really need suffered and died to offer you and me life. He came to save us from sin and death and to give us life. And he came from a great distance away and he became 
a man for our sake that he might save us so in this little story there's something of the bigger story which is about God is at work to save his creation and his people but I wonder if you thought of dogs and a musher as a rescuer I wonder if you thought of them in that way well this story will show by the time we finished it that that's exactly what they were in this instance now here's Blackie he's the lead dog of a sled and he is owned by Wild Bill who is his musher who rides on the sled and who directs the course of the direction that it goes in and he's up there in Alaska waiting serum is on the way some a million over a million units have been found um, way down in the United States but that's going to take some days to get to know too many days for it to be of use in saving the people and stopping the spread of this epidemic it's going to arrive at Seaward and uh, Blackie up there he's waiting and yet serum has already been found in Anchorage at the railway station that's a lot nearer says Blackie I can take that soon if it gets to me and sure enough the serum packed tightly in in padding and in a container weighing some 20 kilos I think or 20 pounds it might have been is making its way up from seaward through Anchorage where it's picked up the serum and continuing on up north and of course because of that you can just about see it on the on the picture there um, going up the center of the railroad there oh Blackie knows it's even better because it means less work for him if the railway can bring it near and when it arrives at the station of Ninana at last Blackie says now I can run this is what he loves to do to be with all the other dogs on his sled pulling the sled wherever his owner wants him to go only 674 miles to go now out to Nome but route through the one of the worst winters on record you expect me to go that far says Blackie well no not actually because the plan is to go halfway and to meet somebody coming from the other way who's also done half of the journey you don't have to do it all Blackie well he's glad about that because the winter is terrible but having said that Blackie has been trained all of his life for a moment like this he's good at what he does he loves to run he finds the trail he leads the rest of the dogs well even when it's minus 52 degrees centigrade because that is how cold it is and he says yes my creator made me able to run even when it's freezing and if there is trouble on the route my owner well Bill he'll rub down my body and put warmth back into me and he'll feed me and we'll get through and so there the serum is on its way it's left the railway station it's going out in that terrible weather and you can perhaps just get a feel for how bad it is the wind blowing and the frosty icy weather that there is out there meanwhile nearly 700 miles away another set of dogs is about to set off from Nome Leonard Seppler is the one the musher who is going to lead them and be with them and the dog out front is Togo he's perhaps the best lead dog in the whole region he's intelligent he's clever he's got a good nose he can feel with his paws or whether ice is thin and dangerous or whether it's secure to run on a very clever dog and a very brave and courageous dog who can keep going for mile upon mile upon mile running with the rest of the team they intend to meet Bill, while Bill halfway and pick up the serum from his sled shift it to theirs and bring it all the way back but unknown to Leonard 
and Togo, plans have changed. Will they meet Wild Bill? Now that the plans have been changed and they don't know about them. And will the serum survive the journey? Will it freeze on the way and be no use whatsoever? Maybe it'll fall off the sled and get lost. Maybe a moose will come out and attack the dogs and stop them on their journey. We'll wait until next week to find out what happens. There's no place like no. This is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Good morning. We're looking at that passage now that Ed Smythe read to us, and it's Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 4. And uh, this morning I want to start off by making four introductory rem remarks about this passage. I'll try and move through them fairly quickly. Um, first of all, just to emphasize what the gospel is, because Paul in this letter to the Colossians gives a description of it to us in the first chapter. And we have looked at this before. I have um, mapped it out with a picture of a pathway up a mountain. That's not to say that this is moving on to higher and better ground, because once you're a believer in Christ, um, you have fullness in him. But it just gives you aspects of the journey that every believer is a part of. And uh, just to say, it says in Colossians 1 verses 21 to 23 that once you were alienated but now reconciled to God and that's the starting point for every person who puts their trust in Jesus and then he goes on to speak about the purpose of God in doing that is to present you holy in his sight which primarily is to deal with our sins and make us righteous in his sight but there's also a future sense sense that God is actively involved in a believer's life right now in the present to transform our lives and make it distinctively like his and that is as much a part of the gospel as it is being alienated and then reconciled through the work of Jesus and then he also mentions in Colossians 1 um, if you continue in your faith, not moved from the gospel. And he then says, this is the gospel you heard. So all three of those things are a part of the gospel. The gospel is not just about having your sins forgiven and being made friends with God. It includes this holiness in his sight and holiness of life and a persistent perseverance in this, not moved from this gospel and that gospel. This gospel, the true one, is the one that Paul preaches. So that's the first introductory remark to make on this, the gospel. And then the scope of the gospel life. In Colossians, it mentions that believers have died with Christ. And since then, you have been raised with Christ. There is this movement through death to the old rule of uh, the dominion of darkness and being brought into the kingdom of his son that is a clear break with the old life and being made anew and invigorated and enlivened through the spirit's work and in Christ which is being raised with him that's how it's described here so the gospel um, includes all of those things we saw in its scope and here we're seeing two that the gospel life is actually a radical, radically new way of living. It's nothing, nothing like the old one. That one has gone, and now we're living a new life. Now, the gospel life um, is as a new community. Um, it's one characterized by those attributes of God as He communicates and uh, produces those in us. 
and it's one characterized not by being absorbed in uh, earthly things, but engrossed with the realities of who God is and what he is doing in the world. He is the one that we are to now submit to, and he is the one that calls us to walk in a way that reflects his character and that is submissive and obedience to him. Um, interestingly, in Colossians, it says um, about do not submit to its rules, to the world's rules. And it seems some in Colossians have been pulled away. But the gospel life as a new community is a life not in submission to man-made rules, but in a submission to Jesus Christ himself. And that brings us to the fourth introductory mark, remark on there, that this is a community centred on Christ. We have been raised with Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ. You also will appear with him, Christ. So you're getting these repeated phrases, and actually it's packed in there that everything that a Christian now has is to do with his union with Christ and his association and his faith in him. So those are four introductory remarks. It's a movement from one sphere of rule into another and from death to life and it encompasses all of life in a new community, that is church. Now let's have a look at this raised community because that is the first point that I want to draw out from the passage. Everything that is said in these few verses is shaped by what God has done in Christ. And that is true for the whole community. This is you in the plural right the way through this, written to Colossians, not to one individual. And they've turned to Christ and put their faith in him. They've been raised out of the ash heap, if you like, or taken out of the dung pile. They've uh, escaped death row. And this has happened by the mighty power of God. Already in Colossians, Paul has mentioned God's mighty power and how it is at work in the life of these believers and in, at work in his own life as well. But listen to these words from Ephesians, which is a similar letter to this one, and see what it has to say there about this raised community, this one that has been brought to life and into being. He prays there, I pray that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. And what sort of power is that? Well, he tells us that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. So this new life is not simply a choice. It's not simply a shift in opinion. It is God's powerful resurrection work bringing us into life and into being. It's exactly the same power that brought Jesus to life from the dead and seated him at his right hand. And this is the community that you belong to if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. It's one that has been brought into existence by a mighty and miraculous working of God. Now, um, this raised community must have an overarching passion. We read in this passage, and we're commanded in this passage, to set our hearts on things above. There we are, there's the command in capitals, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, this is not about plane spotting, nor train spotting for that matter. This is about... Um, having our goals and our passions shaped and formed according to who Christ is and what he's about in this, his world. And our aims and our sights ought to be on him, needs to be on him, if we are to live in the right way in the world in which we um, live day by day. Um, this is to have our thoughts set on the desires, the self-sacrificial love and servant-heartedness of God, who is over all, the one who's come near in his Son at great cost, the one who's pursued us and sought after the lost. This is the one that is to shape our hearts. This Christ, too, 
is described elsewhere as one we do not see now, but even though we do not see him now, we love him and are filled with a glorious and inexpressible joy. So setting our thoughts on him is also to set our sights and our goals upon somebody who is incredibly brilliant and is good and faithful and sufficient. And viewing him should bring us joy and pleasure in life. And if we have our minds and our hearts focused on him, that will reflect in our lives, especially as we continue to do that and persist in it. Set your hearts on things above. Now, of course, we're all familiar that we can find ourselves very much engrossed in the here and now. There's a lot going on at this moment and probably before this moment, um, always a lot going on in our lives one way or another. And so given that that is, has been the case, maybe it's been quieter during lockdown, given that that's the case, we need to make sure that we keep our focus in the right place on Christ himself. And this is an overarching passion. This is our goal and ambition is to know him, is to embrace his desires and his will. Jesus, when he taught us to pray, one of the things he said was we should ask God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And these verses are calling us, as it were, to look towards heaven where God is and rules so that we can then pursue his will here on earth in a similar way. And therefore, let this be the metronome, uh, the beat, as it were, to which our thoughts and affections um, keep in time and in step. Because we have been raised with, with Christ, we are part of a new area, a new com community, and our passion should be for God and our ambitions for him. Set your hearts on things above. He also goes on in this passage to say, set your minds on things above. This is slightly different to hearts. Um, hearts is about the whole um, direction of your life. Minds is more about the thoughts. So we're meant to mull over who he is. We're to consider um, what this God is like, why he does things, what shaped uh, his, what shape his life and his uh, actions amongst humanity have taken to ask some of the difficult questions and pursue answers based on his character and his purposes. And most of all, to trust him when we have gone far, so far with our questions that we, we can't go any further and to sit back in awe at the God that we know. So set your hearts, come on, set your minds on things above. This is the overarching passion we should all have. And the raised community know that Jesus is in the place of authority and power. Since you've been raised with Christ, um, set your hearts on things above where Christ is. This is very personal. The one who's given his life is there. And he's not just there, he's at the right hand of God. He's in the place of power, seated. And so we have someone to look to who has an authority and a power above every other power and authority. The stupid thing that's happening in Colossae is some people are advocating submission to rules and certain food laws and particular days and festivals when actually we are to be submitting our lives to Christ and his commands, which are the reality rather than the shadow that was portrayed in some of those Old Testament laws that some people might have been basing their lives on. This one who sits at the right hand of the Father, Jesus, is spoken about in the Old Testament. And God says to my God, and that's the Father, I think, speaking to the Son, uh, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. And there at the right hand of God is the established king who one day will make everything right. And if we are to set our hearts on him and what he is about 
and the good rule that he'll one day bring in. And therefore, as a part of this, in this text, it says um, the race community does not set its sights on earthly things. This is um, to have ambitions and goals that are governed by the material. And earthly things also has in mind um, those things that are under the sway or rule or dominion of the evil one, the domain of darkness. That is not to set our goals. And if we have eyes upwards on the wonderful realities of who God is, hopefully the lure of the pleasures of sin and the temptations that we have here will pale before the pleasures that are offered by God. But we should not set our sights on earthly things. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. It seems to rather surprise that, surprise that harvest mouse. And maybe it surprises us. That doesn't mean to say we should be without ambitions. There may be things God is calling us to do, maybe big things or small things, that we should set about trying to do. And these words about set your minds call for a decisive <coughs> act of the will to do what is being told us to do. But not to set them on earthly things. Because we can have an ambition that is about our position, our pride, our advancement, our popularity, that is not governed by a renewed mind or a spiritual outlook, but is governed very much by what others on earth want. And so our sights must not be set on earthly things. As I've mentioned, we do have lots of cares and concerns. There's all sorts of things in our materialistic Western world that we have to um, juggle and be involved with. It's so easy to be immersed in those and each day to have our agenda set by the demands of others, by a, maybe an employer, by family or whatever else it is. And we are called to look after um, those people, but the governing of our lives needs to come from God, from our our thoughtfulness and our close look at who he is and what he's done and allow that to reshape our ambitions so that we live with a humility and a servant heart in this that is about God first and our neighbour also. So we don't set our hearts on earthly things. That's always a temptation for us but it's not the way that we ought to go and this is commanding us not to go that way. So this raised community is also, uh, as we come on, uh, must not lose connection with its head. And here I get some of you might think frivolous. I'm going to read to you a poem from a poetry book by William Shakespeare. No, by Colin McNaughton. And uh, watch out for the references to head and things like that in this. It's a bit amusing, light-hearted. But Paul has said that some of the people of Colossae are in danger, if not already, have lost connection with their head because they're so busy making their own rules and trying to look good to others. This is the poem, the phantom standing at my bedroom door handed me a note with a grisly paw. Sorry to disturb you in your bed, but you could you help? I've lost my head. I should have shouted for my mum and dad, but his shoulders drooped and he looked so sad. So we searched the house, looked everywhere. At last we found it under the stair. He picked it up and screwed it on, said, ah, oh, that's better. And then he was gone. He upped and left me walk through a wall. Manners of a pig didn't thank me at all. I went upstairs and back to bed. I didn't get angry, I kept my head. But I'm losing patience with that freak. It's the 15th time it's happened this week. If it happens again, I know what I'll do. I'll stick it back on with super glue. Well, you might say that's light-hearted, and it is. Um, but the people there are in danger of losing contact with Jesus and no longer shaping their lives around him. Very things like puffed up, we mentioned last week, totally contrary to the character of God and to his son. And I like this little uh, poem because... Uh, after all this happened, he went upstairs and back to bed. He didn't get angry. He kept his head. 
And although this isn't written from a Christian perspective, it shows you that all that has gone on hasn't rattled this young boy. He's patiently and contentedly got back to his bed. He has not got angry. He's kept his head. And we, don't we, we need to keep our head, keep our contact with the living Lord Jesus. So that as we go through life, we're not acting in a way out of sorts with him, but one very much connected to and in association with, filled with his power. So we must beware of losing connection with the head. And we should seek to do whatever we do, shaped by who we see God is and living out our lives in his image. Yet this life of the raised community is hidden. Did you notice that? For your died, verse 3, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. There it is up on the screen. Hidden. Now there are some things, aren't we, aren't there, that we purposely hide. I'm not thinking of some of the things we're embarrassed about. I'm thinking more about valuables that we might have and precious documents, perhaps, or letters. We'll generally carefully fold them up or pack them and put them in the place, a place where they won't be disturbed and where they'll be kept safe. For you died and your life is now hidden with God in uh, with Christ in God. There is an element here that our life now, through faith in Christ and being raised um, with him, is our life now is with him and he's keeping us safe and holding on to us, wrapped up as, as it were, not immune to difficulties, but wrapped up for a future day when um, we will be unveiled. But right now that life is hidden. Um, I doubt if many of us, maybe any of us, have ever had somebody come up to us and say, you're raised with Christ, aren't you? I mean, that is true if you're a believer, but nobody sees that. Maybe somebody has uh, asked you, sorry, gone ahead too quickly then, has asked you, you know, why are you so content? Why aren't you so anxious at this time? Why, why is that? Some people might have said that to you. Um, I did have an experience like that recently, but somebody might have said that to you. Or somebody might have said, uh, what is it that makes you so happy? Why are you so cheerful? But generally speaking, people can't understand Christians. Yeah, I mean, you get that feeling from some of the rules that the government has given for places of worship. They don't really know what makes us tick or what goes on in our lives. And most people just don't get us, especially if you come to faith in a family or in amongst friends where they don't believe, but you do. And they just don't understand what's happened to you. What's going on? They're not seeing that new heart that you have. They're not seeing this this new life that you that is changing your loves and your taste buds, as it were, for the things of this world. They're not seeing that your life is now in Christ, Christ in this passage, who is your life, both physically and spiritually and in every facet. So I want to talk a little bit about that hiddenness and then we'll get towards the close. And just briefly to go to Harlem, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, near Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And this is back in the time of World War II. Some of you will know this story very well. Um, it's this particular family um, that we're considering, three girls and a son and the mum and dad there, they're believers. It's back, I think this picture was taken in 1900. They are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the father is a watchmaker, and he works or worked from this particular shop, and the family lived above it. And if you saw that shop, it looked just as it was, a watchmaker's shop, and a very good one at, at that. But actually, there were things in this house that were hidden. Because early on in the Second World War, people began to come into this shop looking for help. And the people in the house began to help them because they were being pursued by the Nazis for one thing or another, or maybe involved in the resistance. And some of them were Jews whose life were threatened with deportation and the concentration camps. 
And so they actually built a room in their house where they could hide such people. And you can go and view it if you're ever in that place. It's a little museum, free to enter, I believe, um, with some very helpful guides to explain things to you. And this is the hiding place that they constructed. As you can see, the brickwork has been removed, so you can see what it's like. Um, but there's a false wall there. There's a cupboard here. And if you notice there, you can see through just a bit, bit there. I think you can see my mouse. That was the actual way that they would enter into it. There was a bell that they could ring if um, they were likely to be searched or somebody was coming into the premises who could give away the game that they were hiding and trying to take into safe passage people um, away from the threats that they were um, in danger of. And within a few seconds, once the alarm bell went, they were to go in down the bottom of the cupboard into this little room. They'd take everything off the table so nobody knew they'd been doing something. If there was, a, there was a bed in there and they'd pull all the sheets off and turn the mattress so you wouldn't feel it was warm and that somebody had been there a few seconds earlier. And that was their hiding place. That's the entrance. And that is the size of it. And today you can see this, the glory of that hiding place. I say glory because in a sense there are wonderful things happened through that. People escaped death. People were kept safe. People were passed on to those who could take them to safer places. But you wouldn't have known that this wonderful act of salvation was happening in this place, that this was going on. Um, it was hidden. And now, uh, after the war, we can see something of the things that went on there, even in sad times. Hidden. Let me give another illustration. There are some. Well, what are they? Well, they're seeds. Do you know what type of seeds? Well, they're seeds of this. I always think this is remarkable. You can take this little round ball. You can put it in some mud. You can give it a bit of water. And after a while, you'll have some sweet smelling sweet peas that make a great gift for anybody because they look lovely and they have a beautiful smell if you've got the right variety. Who ever would have thought, um, if you knew nothing about this world, that these little things would end up revealing such beauty? And that is the sort of case with the Christian life. Most people don't know what's within us, what's happening, what's going on. They don't understand us. But one day, the life of Christ in us will be revealed. One day, it's going to appear. And one day, it's going to appear in glory. Not as glory as some of you might think of it, a place, but in glory, in splendor, in might, in brilliance, in its full color, in its full light, in its brilliance. Okay? One day, it's going to appear in glory. When Christ, who is your life, appears, he is coming again, and that's part of the gospel, then you also will appear with him, notice this, with him yet again, in glory. In the day that Jesus returns to this earth to wind everything up, and before the creation of a new heavens and a new earth, we will be taken to be with him, and then it will be seen who we really are, the hiddenness, will be over and the work that God has been doing in us which is transforming us from one degree of glory to another that is often not seen by others maybe sometimes glim great glimmers of it come out in our actions but on that day the work of God will be fully known and will be um, full of praise for him and what he's done and his deliverance of people from the kingdom of darkness just as we close here that takes us through three things here mentioned in this text. Um, that a believer or the believing community, because in the plural, is a, a raised community. has come to life through the mighty power of God. Um, but who you are and what you will be, there's a hiddenness about that that is often a mystery to the world. But a work that God is doing in us and with us. And there will come a future day when that will be fully seen and we will appear with Jesus. Even though you do not see him now, you love him and are filled with a glorious and inexpressible joy. And that joy will be manifest on that day. 
Now, all of these things being written about in these verses have Christ at the centre of it. And if we love him, we will be filled with joy. We will be glad. I know our emotions go up and down, but we will be glad in what he's done. And that should help us to then battle with sin and to put on what is right, which is what the rest of chapter 3 of Colossians focuses in on and continues on through the passage to then look at what this means in relationship to mums and dads, wives and husbands, slaves and their earthly owners. How Christ in our lives shapes those relationships also. But we have finally a stark division being hinted at in this passage. Not only a division between death and life, which is the experience of a person coming to know Christ, but the stark division between those who are with Christ, whose life is hidden with him, who have been raised with him, and those who have not been raised. Although the text doesn't mention them, perhaps you've thought of them. Because to be honest, we don't understand why we were raised when others have not yet been raised. There is a mystery to that. We can understand something of what it means. This passage is talking about that. But actually why us and why not others is a mystery. And it's a sobering mystery. Because we know that some do believe and others have not believed and some will not believe ever in Jesus. And he is your life, it's said to the believers. So to fail to trust him and come to him is to be without life, is to remain in death with all the consequences that means for separation and the horrific future that is in store for those who have not trusted God. For there is a hell and there is a heaven. There's no life without Christ. And as you perhaps you've listened to this, some of you here know that that's true about yourself. Well, here we read and hear what he wants to do for people like you and I. He offers life today if you'll turn to him from your old life and the life that you're living now and set your eyes on following and obeying him and come to him for forgiveness. And we need to ponder that seriously this morning, I think. And if possible, mourn. We can't make ourselves mourn. But sometimes when we think about those who are saved, which is a marvellous thing, and then think about those who are not, it should move us to concern and to sorrow in our hearts and to a desire to share him with others. Well, Phil Royal is going to lead us in prayer and perhaps touch upon some of those things. And I'm going to hand over to him now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truths and realities that we read in these verses of Colossians. We thank you that you have saved us. We thank you that you have disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them on the cross. We thank you that even when we were dead in our sins, you made us alive in Christ. We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, and we thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to come and to give your life, your perfectly lived life, to satisfy the wrath of God, that we, dead in our sins, can be forgiven. We thank you that there is nothing that we can do that can separate us from you because of your love shown to us in Jesus. We thank you, God, for what you have done. We thank you for the fact that we are raised in Christ. And as I pray now, Jesus, you are sat at the right hand of your Father. And we thank you for that reality. And we thank you that we are certain of that. We can be certain of that. We thank you that that means we are saved, we are safe, we are secure in you. And I just pray that you'll help us to realise that and to live in that reality, that it would affect every aspect of our lives, the way we speak, the way we think, what we do with our time, how we spend 
our money, that we would be shaped by this reality that we are in Christ and all that that means. And we thank you for that. But we also recognise, God, in that reality that there are millions around the world who are not in Christ. And locally, amongst our families and our friends, there are those who are not in Christ and it breaks our hearts. And Lord, we pray that you would open their eyes and that they might see the truth and reality that we know. We pray that you would save, that you would um, increase your kingdom, that the people that we know and love would also have these uh, truths and realities in their own hearts. So please do mighty work through us as we seek to reach out to others from our local church. Um, but go where we can't by your spirit and uh, turn hearts of stone uh, to soft hearts. Open the eyes of the blind and may we see many, many people come to live in the reality that we are saved and we can be and live in Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, Phil. And we're going to finish before the notices with a song that's joyful. When I was lost, you came and rescued me. You reached down into the pit and lifted me. O oh Lord, such love, I was as far from you as I could be. But I, by God's grace, you came to qualify me as your son. And that invitation is there for you too. And is the experience of many us, of us here. So let's sing that and enjoy that together this morning.
and now it's time for our notices. So we don't have that many notices to mention at the moment, I don't think. As ever, we have our Sunday stream on Sundays. We also have our antiviral stream, Albasoke Antiviral, available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel coming out on Thursdays. And we're going to be looking at the book of Esther, which I'm very excited about. Um, we're going to look at that this week. Um, also, uh, anything else to mention? We have our quiz on uh, Saturday and our bingo night on Tuesday. And there should be information on the Facebook page about how you can get involved in those events. Uh, Christianity Explored, Colin, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yep, so we're on week four at the moment, or we will be this coming week. Um, you could join in at the moment, but you'd probably be better off if you're interested in finding out what it means to follow Jesus and who Jesus is. You'd be better off probably starting with a new series once we have finished this one. And just to bear in mind too that the course is really helpful for people who want to refresh their understanding of what um, it means to base your life on this person and to trust and follow him. So do let me know, Colin at aechurch.org.uk if you'd be interested in the next course. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. We can definitely run more of those as time goes on in a variety of interesting ways, including over the internet. Mm. Mm. Well, I think there's a, oh no, we need to mention, I nearly forgot again, again, <laughs> the coffee rooms, coffee. the coffee rooms. Um, Carol, do you want to describe your experience of a, a post Sunday stream coffee room? Yeah, it's really nice actually, because we've all listened to God's word, haven't we, uh, in our individual homes. And what's really nice about the coffee lounge is that we can all then connect with each other. So the idea is that you click on the link and you can join the coffee room and you get to chat with the people that are in that room and then maybe if you once you've had a little chat with them you can join another coffee room if you want so it's really i would really encourage people to join in with those because um it is a really lovely way for us to connect with each other and to encourage each other and just to see how we're all getting on so and it makes you feel even though we're not meeting as a church it makes you feel a bit more like we are meeting as a church as well so yeah i'd recommend those yeah, good. Might see you there then. Yes, <laughs> um, and a slightly longer form version of those happens in the midweek in life groups. Um, if you'd like to be involved in a life group where there's um, normally some Bible teaching and some social contact and some prayer, um, do please get in touch either with myself or Colin through the website and we'd be glad to set you up with a life group Zoom or some such meeting like that. Well, I think that's almost the end unless we have a final song, which I don't think we do, do we? Not today. Not today. Well, in that case, all that remains to be saying is see you in the coffee room and stay close to Jesus and, and wash your hands. hands. See you later. <laughs>